Welcome, Naomi Klein, to Intelligence Squared. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all. Um, could you please tell us about your new book, Doppelganger? What is it about? So it's a very different kind of book for me. Um, I usually write pretty conventional nonfiction, you know, thesis, argument, argument, thesis, <laughs> argument. Um, this is more of a mix of of memoir and cultural analysis. Um, it's an exploration of um, of doubling, of doubles, of doppelgangers. It begins with having what it's like to have have a doppelganger, somebody who much of the world thinks is you, um, but is not you. Mm. And um, and then just kind of uses that as a device to understand some political dynamics where um, our world is sort of doubling and we are mirroring um, the people that we disagree with, whatever they're against, we're for, whatever whatever they're for, we're against. That's really kind of becoming clearer and clearer in U.S. politics. Um, and ultimately, I think what the book is about is the doppelganger that I most fear and that I think a lot of us fear, which is which is the way whole societies have a kind of an evil twin version of themselves and the sort of the way we know societies can flip and become um, much uglier, more dangerous versions of themselves. Not to idealize our world right now, but it can get worse. Um, oh, so no. yeah, <laughs> so it's about fascism is the short answer. Um, so you use a, a phrase, the mirror world. Mm -hmm. And can you describe what exactly is the mirror world? Is that what you're talking about now? Well, so what, what? So the book is. Um, it looks at at the way we double ourselves, you know, yeah. through branding, creating like um, sort of public versions of ourselves or digital versions of ourselves that we perform for others. So sort of partitioning ourselves, um, and it looks at the way AI is creating doubles of our basically our whole culture. It's sort of a mimicry machine, um, but by mirror world. Um, I'm, I guess I'm talking about conspiracy world um, and my own doppelganger. Um, I mean, people who people, people I, I don't think she looks like me, but other people confuse <laughs> confuse us all the time. Um, Naomi Wolf, um, you know, she she um, was sort of evicted from kind of let's say like liberal. Um, society, you know, deplatformed from Twitter uh, multiple times and 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 other social media sites. And, you know, she used to be somebody who wrote for, you know, The Guardian and The New York Times and um, for various reasons was deplatformed, as she likes to say. And now she pals around with Steve Bannon and Tucker Carlson and has become a pretty consequential figure in the cons on the conspiratorial right. Um and the mirror element is is that when people get deplatformed from from spaces that are you know more liberal um, you know media spaces spaces or platforms, mm -hmm. there's often the perception that they've kind of disappeared from planet Earth, yeah, um, because because we don't see them anymore. And I think social media trains us to mute and block, and we're just like you're dead to me, you know. And so when when she was deplatformed, pretty much everyone I knew thought she no longer needed to be paid attention to. But because yeah. I was sort of on this rabbit hole journey, I was. I it really struck me that she had not been deplatformed. In fact, she had a much bigger platform than she um, than she'd had in years. I mean, she was on Tucker Carlson's show before it was canceled, mm -hmm. which had three million viewers a night. She was on Bannon's show. It's you know one of the biggest podcasts. Um, very, very consequential political platform, but none of it was visible in our world. Right. So, so, you know, the, what I, what I talk about in the book is it be, being kind of like one way glass yeah. in that we can't see them, but they can see us. In fact, they're obsessed with us. They're watching us very, very closely and they're mirroring us. Right. So there's like mirror versions of everything in our world, in the mirror world. Like if you get caught, get kicked off Twitter, then you go to Getter, or, you know, if you get kicked off YouTube, then you go 
to um, Rumble or Parlor mm-hmm. or you know a, a, you know and there's Mirror Publishing Houses now and and um, it's very deliberate you know Steve Bannon talks about how we need our own currency we need you know we, that we can't ever let them erase us again and so that's how we why we need to build this mirror world but there's also a way in which many of the ideas that are important to me as somebody who's been you know part of the left for many years. Um, are being picked up in the mirror world and sort of turned into twisted doppelganger versions of themselves, including the the fight against fascism. Like Mm -hmm. all the language gets appropriated and kind of twisted to use for ends that are really not the ends they're intended, including freedom of speech, right? Because these are many of the people who are supporting book bans and... um, you know, are very comfortable censoring, um, but they use the discourse of freedom of expression, um, you know, for their own ends. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's a it's a weird kind of warped mirror. It's a warped mirror world. It isn't yeah. just a straight up reflection. It's a weird funhouse mirror. Yeah. Um, but you know, one of the things that I'm, you know, I I think I really tried to be careful about in the book is this sort of default liberal smugness of we're the sane ones, we're the righteous ones, they're the bad people. Mm -hmm. Um, Because a lot of the ideas that they're picking up, they're picking up because they've been left unattended. (laughs) You know, they they have not been, um, they're not being used to their full effect um, um, by leftists and progressives. Um, And um, yeah, and I think all of us engage in various tactics of unseeing, of distraction. Um, and and I think we're all, you know, conspiracy theories, I'd be interested in your take on it, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of what conspiracy theories do is distract our attention from systemic crises, right? Yep. And for that reason, even though conspiracy theorists are always talking about the elites, the elites, they're, they're the best friends the elites could ever have because they prevent us from speaking about they distract us from speaking about systems yep. and they steer us towards the cabal, mm. right? And that's always been the role that conspiracy has played for power. Yeah, um, It's better to think of three or four people in a room, um, maybe the Rothschilds or, you know, whatever the, the the latest iteration of it is, than it is to talk about capitalism and, 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 and the system doing what it was designed to do, right? Um, so I think... There are many ways of not looking at systems. And I would say that, you know, we're we're all pretty good at it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I was really struck in the book that you, yeah, you pointed out some of the ways, especially online, we use humor to diminish um, these figures and the power they have. We say, I think there was a phrase, something about a cell phone that you used. Can you remind me what that was? Um, Yeah. And do you think that the way we joke about them really is not, allowing us to take them seriously and, you know, tackle the issue of conspiracies and conspiracy circles and conspiracy impact. And and also, what is the wellspring that they are tapping into, right? They're tapping into a sense of deep injustice. Mm. They're tapping into a rage at inequality, at, at impunity for, for elites, right? So, so, you know, what I you're referring to that line about cell phones. So specifically, that's referring to um, propagation of, of this idea that vaccine verification apps were actually about monitoring us and eavesdropping on us and 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 ushering in what she described as like a CCP, like, like Chinese Communist Party um, uh, system of social credits, right? And she was saying, you know, once you have the vaccine app on your phone, they can listen to your conversations in restaurants. They know when you're in your living room. And um, the response on liberal Twitter was, wait till they hear about cell phones, right? And, you know, the first time I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, wait till they hear about That's funny, mm. right? Because, of course, we're all being monitored by our cell phones. And here they are fixating on this one app. Yeah. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, you know what? It's not funny that we think that our that, that that we all just sort of take it for granted that our phones could be eavesdropping on us or that we're being tracked, but we have normalized that, right? Mm-hmm. And so what happens when you normalize something that really shouldn't be normalized? Well, it comes 
it, 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 it reemerges in, in what I'm calling the mirror world in this strange way, in this doppelganger way. It's, it's kind of like QAnon and this idea that the elites are like draining our children of their life force, adrenochrome, you know, so that they can stay young forever. That's not happening. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can make the argument that, you know, uh, we live in a system that is draining um, our children's futures. Um, and so, you know, the way I put it in the book is, conspiracy theories, these conspiracy theories, because there are some real conspiracies in the world, that's also important to yeah. remember. Um, they get the facts wrong, but they get the feelings right. Yes. So I think that that is why this these ideas that are that are really unhinged and, and are not attached to reality, no, those vaccine apps were not eavesdropping on us in restaurants. Um, but there are so many issues that are going unaddressed in our culture that it's like we've we've uh, we've abandoned too much territory and it's too potent to just be left there by the Steve Bannons of the mm-hmm. world like they're going to move in you know yeah. it's kind of like what Bannon did in 2016 when he was working for Donald Trump i mean arguably he still is but in 2016 you know he he was just looking at who had the democratic party abandoned you know and he saw all these you know white working class men who's factories had been offshored and who were enraged about the trade agreements that they felt had screwed them. And he was like, this is a constituency that, that, that they've abandoned and we're going to, we're going to speak to it. And they didn't really have anything to offer them, but, but leaving, leaving constituency, abandoning people is, is a problem because someone's going to come along and, uh, and fill, fill that space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go back to a point that you just made, because I think it was a really good point about this kind of fear we have around technology in it. I think you kind of mentioned in the book that the fear is real, but obviously, as you said now, they've jumped in on it and they've provided all these reasons, whether it's, you know, um, vaccine apps, monitoring us, all these kind of things. And it's funny that the timing of this, we're recording this in June when Mm -hmm. Black Mirror drops, that very Mm -hmm. real fear around what the future of tech is. It seems like we've signed a contract, but we don't know what we've signed. And it's it's leaping forwards and lurching forwards. And I think you label that and you identify that really well. Can you talk about that fear and what that's done for the gap for conspiracy circles? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 the whole tech economy is like those terms of service agreements, right? That go on for pages and pages and pages, and then no one reads them. No one reads them, and and it's an extract. You know, our our consent is being (laughs) extracted because we need to like get to the next to the other end of it. Like we have to get online, we have to fill out a form. I mean, everything happens online now. So Mm -hmm. we need to, we need to get to the other side. So we consent, except it isn't real consent and we did not read it and we don't know what's in it, but it turns out that we've signed away a whole lot. Right. And, you know, and this is, you know, the the thesis of Shoshana Zuboff's book, um, the, the, the age of surveillance capitalism, um, that this is really an, uh, a historic enclosure of, of, you know, what, it, I mean, I would say the commons, but also of just ourselves, of, of un, previously unenclosed space, like the relationship between friends, mm-hmm. right? It was not previously something that could be, you know, commoditized, right? Yeah. Um, if you were just chatting with a friend, that there would be no way of getting that data that wasn't data that was just a conversation but once it happens on a platform it becomes data sure and if you signed if you signed the 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 form that you didn't read then it turns out that that data isn't yours and that you are a mind site you you know that 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 our that our everything in our lives our 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 photographs our chats our every post it's all it's all being extracted and now with ai it's we find out that it's actually being extracted to create kind of doubles of all of us, to create a real mirror world. Like that's what AI is. That's a whole other kind of mirror world. It is just, it's a mimicry machine, right? Yeah. So so all of human culture is just being copied and copied and copied and copied. And and, and then we feel replaced and should, you know, I mean, it's 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 a pretty, this is, it's another way in which being alive today is very destabilizing. Yeah. Um, so is climate change. Um, you know, so is COVID. And conspiracies always surge in moments like this, right? Where we need we need a story to explain our world. And conspiracies are 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 easy to understand theories. Yeah. yeah. 
with, yeah, with uh, evil, evil characters, right? Yeah, villains mm-hmm. and heroes, and then a fight and a cause. Yeah, and the villains and heroes is really interesting because you know, as, like, not to harp too much on this, but I am a leftist, Please <laughs> and, and and leftists, um, you know, have a theory of capital, have have a theory of um, that 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 much of these symptoms are not because of a plot behind the scenes, but it's actually just a logical outcome of a system that is built to maximize profits. Mm. And this is why, you know, anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are often, or you know, have long been referred to as the socialism of fools, right? Mm. Because rather than seeing a system, you imagine a cabal, you imagine this small group um, who are making all the decisions because you don't have a systemic analysis. Mm. So I'm familiar with Naomi Wolf having reported on COVID conspiracies. It felt like she was a real leader, Mm -hmm. shall we say, in that movement. Um, Can you explain to somebody who isn't familiar with her who she is and why her her influence is so significant within this scene and within the mirror world and conspiracy circles? Well, I think that her influence is um, is significant mainly because of who she used to be, yeah. or you know who she, who she was. Um, you know, when I was in university, she was um, she was part of what was being called the third wave of feminism. So, you know, I, I was a teenager in the eighties. It was a very kind of um, lull period for progressive politics. Feminism was sort of um, it was still happening. There was still all kinds of great work being done but it was really outside the outside the glare of the media spotlight i mean these were this was you know the re- years of reagan and thatcher and then at the dawn of the 90s along comes naomi wolf and a few others um and she had written this book called the beauty myth um and it was um you know not that innovative in terms of its analysis of, of uh you know the amount of time, uh, time in particular, that that women were expending to meet a particular beauty ideal, she was making an argument that women's um, that the successes of the second wave of feminism um, that had uh, made it so that m- more and more women were going into universities, more and more women were going to the workplace, were being pushed back by this. A heightened beauty standard so that just as women were breaking through, they were spending so much time trying to look like, as she put it, professional beauties, right? Mm-hmm. And she was making the argument that previously women had not been held to such high beauty standards. Now, obviously that's debatable and and culturally contingent and so on. Um, but there was there was no doubt that there was you know a rise in anorexia at that time, um, and it was like the aerobics craze and and so on. And that, so that book was a huge bestseller, mm-hmm. and it really put her on the map. Um, and she went on to become a, a, a consultant for the Democratic Party, um, and uh, she was married to um, somebody who was a speechwriter for Bill Clinton, and then she was the women's issue advisor for Al Gore when he ran for president. And so she was sort of a fixture on talk shows and things um, uh, in throughout the Mm -hmm. nineties. And so, and she, she had a particular niche around women's bodies um, and sexuality. So after the beauty myth, she wrote a book called fire with fire. Then she wrote a book called misconceptions was, which was about young women and sexuality. And then she wrote a book about um, women in childbirth. And so I, I, in answer to your question about why she had particular influence, um, I think it's because it's because of that previous work and where she really had a big I- I- impact in COVID, where, where you know where, where where the data shows she really um, you know became a vector of quite a lot of medical misinformation, was around the vaccine shedding yep. myth. Um, so NPR did did it, did an investigation of like why it was that so many w- women were suddenly afraid that they were going to become infertile, not if they got the COVID vaccine, but even if they were around somebody who got the COVID vaccine, because it would shed on them. And so they did this data analysis and found that 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 a lot of that misinformation could be traced to a few key tweets by um, other Naomi, as I call her. Other Naomi. <laughs> and so I think that at that point, I thought, well, this is 
you know, there, there's a line that I return to several times in the book from Philip Roth's Operation Shylock, where he says about his 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 doppelganger who is wrecking, wreaking havoc. Um, it's too ridiculous to take seriously and too serious to be ridiculous mm. in the sense that, um, you know, nobody likes being confused with anyone else and, you know, and but we all deal with it and it happens, right? Um, but when the person you're being um, confused with is seemingly spreading, you know, m- medical misinformation that could cause real damage um, and, and cost lives um, and you're in the middle of a global pandemic, it's sort of, you know, it, it feels like a slightly higher stakes I would say, yeah, I would say it's a, a higher stakes than being confused for a, a colleague or something at work, for sure. Um, I think when I was reading the book and you mentioned that this is this feels like a different piece to your other works, mm-hmm. there's a level of vulnerability you have in the book. What was it like writing this compared to your other works and, you know, expressing how much this took a toll on you, getting confused for other Naomi, but also going down the rabbit hole and throwing yourself into this investigation um, because you mentioned, you know, the impact on loved ones and for your own mental health as well. Mm. What was that like sharing that? Well, I hope you found it a little bit funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely, there were funny moments for sure. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, 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 to write in a more personal way. I wanted to write, you know, when, when I started writing at, in, in, when I was, you know, a teenager and in my twenties, um, I did actually a lot more humor writing and more personal writing. And you know, my first book, No Logo, is a little bit more like that. It's more personal and it's sort of a, a critique of the culture from inside the culture. Like I, you know, it's like, yeah, I want them to, I want the brands to, like, I want all the shiny <laughs> things, you know? And I think um, because I, I had this like really great fortune um, as a young writer to have my first book kind of blow up and to have myself kind of turned into the face of this kind of new left at that time. Mm. I think the, every, my writing afterwards was sort of carrying the weight of the left on my shoulders. It got very, very serious. That sounds pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think I, I sort of didn't joke anymore and I really felt like I had to be so bulletproof and, and, um, and, and I think it, the, the short answer to, to your question is that it was actually really fun to write. It was fun to be able to play with character. It was fun to sort of present myself as this destabilized narrator <laughs> who had fallen down the rabbit hole. And there is genuinely something liberating about realizing that no matter what you do, people are going to think you're absolutely nuts. Well, yeah, I guess that's like the loss of the loss of character. Then you're just yeah. like, let's just let's just go with it. Yeah. What do I have to lose? Yeah. Um, what was the impact of falling down the rabbit hole and tracing other Naomi Hmm. um, for so long. What was, what was that like for you? What was, what was that like? Yeah. Um, I actually felt like, like I, I understood, like I I felt like I under, it, it helped me understand our world better. I think it's important to look at what people who you may disagree with are, are saying and doing and try to understand why it's resonating. And, you know, so many people who I talk to just completely tune it out. And if I say, well, like I heard Steve Bannon talking about this and like, why are you listening to Steve Bannon? And, you know, I say like, cause he's listening to us. <laughs> like, I mean, he's crafting a political agenda out, out of our, um, out of our failures, neglect and hypocrisies. So we should probably pay attention to how it's going. Cause you know, it's changed the world before. Um, uh, you know, it helped get Trump in once, it could get him in again. Yeah. So uh, I guess I don't think we should ignore it. And I I learned a lot. <laughs> and not just in the sense of, oh, they're such terrible people. Um, I already thought that. Um, I think what I learned more was about what liberals and leftists have abandoned that has created such fertile territory for the right to exploit, including how we treat people poorly, how we, how we're just the sort of um, intolerance and, and some of the abusive cultures on the left. Um, that's also fertile territory to sort of position oneself as welcoming, accepting. It's nonsense. These are, you know, racists who want, you know, to build walls at borders and, you know, have are animated, I believe, by tremendous rage. When I'm here, I'm talking specifically about Bannon and Carlson. Um, 
but I'm really interested in the way they um, just, they play on the intolerance that is real on the left, mm. you know, and say like, oh no, I'm willing to talk to somebody who I disagree with, unlike those people, you right. know? Um, and they kind of cosplay um, uh, acceptance and inclusion and belonging. I use those words a lot. It's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, it reminds me a lot of, in the book, you talk about how other Naomi, I'll just call her that for now because mm. it's a great term, but she was accepted by that side of things, by that side of the mirror world. And it feels like it just reminded me of almost like a congrega congregation, mm -hmm. just kind of welcoming that kind of figure into their wings. And yeah. it reminds me, of course, of Kanye West as well. Mm -hmm. And all these kind of figures that, you know, have a public um, annihilation of their reputation, their personalities, and these extreme fractions of our worlds accept them in and almost like, you know, hug them into yes. their folds. Yes. And it's interesting because R RFK Jr., you know, is 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 running to to uh, be the Democratic nominee. He's not going to win. I don't see how that math could happen. Mm. But he's certainly a chaos agent. Um, and he's certainly playing a role to demoralize the Democratic base. Um, and they were already pretty demoralized <laughs> because of all of the betrayals. Um and, but it was interesting when, um, and I write about this in the book, that d December 2021, Bannon had RFK on his show and gave him the entire show and just performed this. Uh, you have just been excommunicated from liberal society. The New York Times just took you down. But you will always get a fair hearing here. We're not like that. Mm. And it was just this, and the, it was, it was as you say, like this, this, this performative hug. Um, after he had just gotten kicked, right? Mm. Um, and I guess, you know, in, in terms of what my biggest takeaway is, is it's it's much less about what they're doing. You know, like we could sit and complain, oh, they've co-opted this issue and this term and that, but it's like, it's only available to be co-opted <laughs> if it's not being, if, 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 if we, you know, uh, air quotes, we, um, uh, uh, on the left are not doing enough. So big pharma, for instance, they go on and on and on about, about big, big pharma yep. um, or, or big, or big tech, um, you know, how much, and, and, and position themselves as being the ones who are taking on big pharma, who are willing to take on big tech. Um, that's only possible because, you know, at least in the U.S., it's like basically just Bernie Sanders who's banging on, um, you know, and a few few other members of the squad. But the mainstream Democratic Party is fully in bed with, mm. you know, the pharmaceutical companies and um, and the big tech companies. And there's an absolute revolving door um, if you look at who their leadership is. I mean, same same as the UK. I was going to say we're, <laughs> yeah. not, we're not that different. Yeah. yeah. Um, but these are potent issues. Mm. People are upset about them. Mm. And if, if if we aren't speaking to them and if we aren't proposing real solutions, then they will reappear in the mirror world and there will be these sort of fake populist solutions yeah. that are not real solutions and that mostly, you know, it, involve just scapegoating 